So I'm so glad for this opportunity and that you guys were all um, interested in this topic and that you're coming out to hear this today and learn new skills, so welcome. And I'm gonna start a little bit just by talking about me. So you probably had an opportunity to read my bio. I'm not gonna talk about my bio. I'm actually going to share a little bit more about me personally and just give you a sense of you know, who's talking to you and what I'm talking about. I put pictures up here that I thought represented me and who I am. What I'm gonna share about more specifically is my husband, because he's incredible and incredibly supportive. Um, I'm gonna tell you about what he said to me when I said I wanna go back to school to get an MBA. He said, oh no, I thought I got my wife back. <laughs> and where he was coming from is he had just gone through a process of seven years with me getting a master's, a PhD, doing an internship, doing a postdoc, doing several exams, and it was a lot. And you know, it's great for people that can do it all. For me, it's like one thing or the other, so it's like either school or the relationship, and sometimes he got the short end of the stick. And so I was aware of where he was coming from, and at the same time, I had done my own reflection and you know, emotional um, journey and realized that this was the next appropriate step for me. So this needed to happen. And hearing where he was coming from, I was like scared because it's like, oh my gosh, am I gonna have to compromise on something that's really important to me? So this is kind of part of what emotional intelligence is about, is you're aware of your own emotions and your own experience in the moment. And you're also aware of another person's experience in the moment, and you're kind of working through it to find workable ways. And so I kind of realized, okay, we have to have a conversation, an uncomfortable conversation, and we did. And I'm happy to say that it, ended up being win-win. Um, but again, we, to do that, that meant we had to kind of approach those experiences and those feelings and not just kind of run away or do whatever I had so that I could have what I want and just kind of you know, get, on, get on the bandwagon and you know, just be on board. So it took a conversation. I'm sharing this story for multiple reasons. Of course, to model a little, a little bit of what social and emotional intelligence looks like and also to let you know how it requires you to be present and mindful and, and in the moment. And then the other reason why is because although we're applying this to work, if you're doing it right, it's going to go across your life. So it's going to be in your personal relationships. You don't check it at the door you know, when you leave work and go home and all of a sudden you're someone different. It's in your home. It's in your personal relationships, in your professional relationships. And so that's why I'm sharing that to you, um, with you rather. So this is what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about these concepts, social and emotional intelligence and cross-cultural competency, and as it relates to the future of work. And then um, we're going to learn some very practical tools that you can use right now and practice with them. Um, I'm going to try to divide the time. I'm going to talk with you for um, a third of the time. I'm going to have you practice the skills on your own, so you're going to partner up a bit for a third of the time. And then I'm going to bring you back, and we're going to discuss kind of how it went um, by then. Being in my field, of course I care about how you feel and your emotions. So by the end of this, I want you to feel empowered and hopeful. If you've been in any presentations talking about the future of work, you probably are aware that you can leave feeling very differently. So that's not my intention. I want you to be excited about it by the end. So mindfulness. We're not gonna talk about this a lot, but we're gonna start here because all of the skills and tools that we're gonna learn today require you to be mindful. Mindfulness is basically non-judgmental present moment awareness, so it's an ability to be in the present moment. Anytime you're paying attention on purpose, you're practicing mindfulness. The specific skills of mindfulness are noticing, observing, and describing. So all you're doing is just noticing what's happening, you're observing them, and then you're just gonna describe them. So put, putting into words whatever it is you're noticing. The most common like, form of practicing mindfulness that most people are aware of is mindfulness meditation. But anytime you're paying attention on purpose, it's a form of practice. So we're not gonna do mindfulness meditation. What we're gonna do is, I'm gonna read a few sentences to you. And what I want you to do while I'm reading is I want you to notice your own experience. So notice it internally in terms of if there's any like emotional responses, if you notice any feelings of discomfort, um, what's going through your mind, if you're finding yourself wanting to think about something else, if you find yourself wanting to distract yourself, if you're you know, feeling a little bit fidgety, notice that. Notice if you feel like, okay, I wanna, you know, whatever I'm hearing is making me uncomfortable. So any feelings of discomfort. So just notice that. 
And then after, um, and non-judgmentally, so what that means is when you're noticing what's happening, it's not good or bad. You're not going to try to push it away and say, I don't want to feel that. You're just going to pay attention to it. And then after we do this, I'm going to bring you back, and I'm going to maybe one or two people can share out about kind of what you notice and observe in your experience. Okay? So I'm going to read, and you're just going to notice and observe. We're automating. If you've ever had to deal with people on a production floor, you know why. Machines don't have attitudes, and it's never been cheaper. Automation and AI will take all our jobs away. If we can digitize work, it can go anywhere. It's more effective to develop in people the capability and internal resources to invent work for themselves and the work of the future. We can't rely on old ideas. We must create value around new possibilities. The most exciting enterprises are making it up as they go. They're comfortable with ambiguity and uncertainty. Foretelling the future of work is no easier than foretelling the future of anything. The future of work depends less on our digital creations than on our collective imagination. OK. Brave soul, number one. Who's OK sharing like what they noticed and observed as I was reading through those sentences from the first one through the last one? OK, so in the excuse me, navy and white. Okay, so first one, dire. Second one is having power to create a future. And tell me a little bit more. So that's correct in terms of the assessment of the content. Tell me about you. Did you notice you having any reactions? Did you notice you like maybe having a preference for one than an another? Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Wanted to tune out the first ones. Like, yeah, right on. Thanks. And I saw some other hands. Yeah, let me go here in the black. OK. OK, so you like the one about ambiguity and creating things as you go. You notice yourself feeling emotions of, OK, excitement, happy. Right on. So one up here. I think what I noticed is it kind of went from individual and self-centeredness to more collective mm -hmm. and more thinking about uh, the opportunity rather than, again, negative to positive. Yeah, totally. And tell me about your experience of that. So in, in terms of you notice that that's what the content was, what about how you felt or reacted or to that? So it's a topic I'm familiar with, and so I feel inspired when we get to the collective intelligence. And it's not just because it's the last thing there, but because that's the uh, unleashing of potential. Right on. OK. So the feeling of inspiration. Yeah. 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 One more. Yeah, wonderful. Tense and defensive. So you notice that you're, you're kind of like body and self wanting to just not hear it, not engage with it. Yeah. Oh, nice. Good. Disagreement. Quick to have a reaction. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. So that's our mindfulness exercise of today. We're not going to talk about it anymore, but just keep in mind just that ability to be aware, describe, and noticing what's happening in that moment is an important quality. So why does this matter? So you know, we talk about globalization and AI and automation and changes in work cultures. It's all happening and it's, and it's all coming. And so what the Institute of the Future did is they identified 11 skills that they're saying, hey, it's important to have these to be ready for whatever the future of work looks like. I kind of like the last quote in terms of like, no one really knows what it's going to look like because we can't really predict with certainty anything. But we can kind of make some, you know, um, projections based on what we do know today and kind of where the trends are going. Um, these are three main points because it's a pretty big um, discussion and a pretty big topic, but I'm kind of bringing out three points as it relates to social and emotional intelligence and cross-cultural competency. Um, for those that want to learn more, I do have a link provided for the Institute of the Future on your handout, as well as a couple of other bullet pointed highlights of like kind of how um, these changes are relating specifically to these skills. But to highlight, basically, first of all, humans need to be able to do things that machines can't do, number one. Number two, 
teams will be multinational. So we're not just talking about here in the state or even in the US. We're going to be a part of teams all across the country. And so it's going to be important to know how to engage with others that are different from ourselves, as well as quickly build rapport with people. And then number three, you might be familiar with a lot of the research about diversity and how it relates to engagement and innovation and even return on investment. But the thing about it is without cultures of inclusion and diversity, or excuse me, inclusion and belonging, you're not going to get the benefits of diversity. If people don't feel comfortable enough to show up and bring whatever they can uniquely contribute to the conversation. So who do we think is going to be on the front lines building these cultures, modeling these cultures? It's managers, it's leaders. And so that's why this talk is designed specifically for managers and leaders. If you are one, if you're aspiring to be one, wonderful. If you're not, that's OK. Because in the future, one of the directions that's going is like teams. And so not that teams are being managed, but that teams are being self-managed. So you will even have um, opportunities to kind of practice leadership qualities, even if you're not in those official capacities. So it's going to be relevant for everyone. So again, there's more reading in your handout if you do want to kind of talk more or learn more about this topic. OK, so we know. We live in real life, the real world. And as much as we would love to just check our emotional stuff at the door when we go into work, or other things that are impacting us, just not bring them to work, just leave them at home, and then you come to work and you can just show up and be this wonderful person, that doesn't happen. This is the reality about humans. This is the reality about people. And so basically, what you get when you get a person, so I'm saying this is like a report. So if you're a leader or you're a manager, this is your report. Your report's coming into the door with their authority history. So in terms of the first people in your life that you know, are authority figures are your parents. If you had parents and they were open and they want to encourage you to grow and try new things, then that's great. That's your representation of authority. If you had parents and for whatever reason, maybe it was scary or you, you only go to authority when you're getting in trouble or it's a very reprimanding relationship, then that's your history. And so that could reflect on how you're relating to your manager, how you're relating to your boss. So that's real. A stress response. So when people are stressed, we, we understand there's a lot of things going on biologically in our bodies, but at the same time, it impacts us. We're not really ourselves sometimes when we're under a lot of stress. And people respond to stress differently. So again, depending on that person's stress response, that's coming in the room as well. That's coming in that conversation. Interpersonal style, so how you're relating to other people. If you're maybe more assertive, more passive, maybe you tend not to speak up or advocate for your needs or even recognize that you can do that. So that's going to come to play. Traumatic experiences. So, you know, many people have a lot of traumatic experiences. And just because you've experienced something that was traumatic to you, it doesn't mean that a person develops PTSD from it. It just means it had a significant impact. And if it had an impact, that means that something else can also trigger that trauma and bring it up in something that's completely unrelated. But emotionally or mentally, it could still trigger that same response. So sometimes that can happen as well. Cultural background, so again, they're different. It depends on if it's individualistic, if it's collectivistic. But again, that's going to come into play for sure. And while it's great to be familiar with different cultures, even when you do that, you're not sure how much that individual ascribes to that culture. So it's not, it won't hurt you to be familiar. But again, at the same time, it's just you know, acknowledging that reality as well. And then finally, current stressors. So we talked about how a person responds to stress, but we just never know what's going on in a person's life, what's going on in their home financially or whatever the case may be. But you know, we have stress in our lives. And so that's going to impact the person. And that's going to impact that person who's coming to work, how they're doing their work, how they're interacting with you as a leader or a manager or a colleague. So all of these are in play. And this is the reality about people. And it's the reality about not just them, but about us as well. So you know, the other person, this is what they're bringing. And we're bringing the same thing. So that's important to remember. And again, this is, this is reality. So what we're going to do today, I'm, I'm going for a biggest bang for your buck approach. So we've got you know, emotional and social intelligence and cross-cultural competency. The two skills that we're going to build, let's see if I can, there we go. Humble inquiry and validation are the two specific tools that you're going to learn and that we're going to talk about. These other columns, social intelligence, so this is the definition, a keen awareness of the value of social connections, the ability to take another's perspective, and the capacity to engage in satisfying relationships. As it pertains to the tools that we're learning today, 
Um, the part in the middle, the ability to take another's perspective is what's gonna be um, most pertinent to those two skills. Emotional intelligence, the capacity to be aware of own and others emotions and discriminate, ability to regulate and express one's emotions and an ability to handle interpersonal relationships judiciously and empathically. So I thought validation would be most pertinent to that, but you can disagree and that's okay. So if you think that, you know, no, humble inquiry is really what's gonna be essential, that's okay as well. And then cross-cultural competency, the ability to understand others in a different cultural context, the ability to effectively perform with others in a different cultural context, and the ability to communicate and engage with others in a different cultural context. And again, the first part and the last part are the two that are going to apply to those tools. Um, and then in case you're wondering, I keep saying we're learning two, two um, competencies, and I have social and emotional kind of separated, but emotional... Uh, intelligence is considered a form of social intelligence. So we're learning both, but technically they're kind of one. Okay. Hmm. All right, humble inquiry. So what humble inquiry is, is it's a way to engage with another person where as a leader, you are choosing to engage from a place of humility and make yourself vulnerable. So there's a tendency, especially if you're in a position of leadership, to do and tell. And like you, you, know, you need to kind of be more directive. With humble inquiry, you're going to choose not to be that way. You are acknowledging that this person has something that I need, whether it's information or you know, something else you want to know from them. So you're choosing to humble yourself. Um, the, when you think about like humble inquiry and how it's different than other types of inquiry, you're coming into the conversation with no agenda for the purpose of building the relationship and helping to make sure that the other person feels like they have an equal voice and an equal say in that conversation. And so it's less about what you're saying. It's more about how you're saying what you're saying, which again, no agenda, and why you're saying what you're saying, which is for the purpose of building a relationship. And you know, the tendency of work culture in the US tends to be very task oriented, but this is about understanding that if we're working with humans, we're building a relationship with another human, and you're, it's more likely to be effective as it pertains to that relationship. You want people to feel like they can trust you, and if you know, there's something that's gonna be a, a problem to the project or a problem to the team, you want them to feel like they can come to you and feel safe. So that's kind of the purpose of engaging this humble inquiry skill. I'm going to pose a quick question for you, or to you rather. So can we simulate being caring if we don't have the feeling or attitude humble inquiry demands? So can we fake it? This is my question to you. Brave souls to give a, a thought on this. Yes? If, if you're not actually engaged with someone and you're not listening and not trying to really put yourself there with them, you're not going to remember what was said to you or you're going to have that context of um, when you need to go back to that information later to, to go to that connection. So I think faking it till you make it is very visible and actually works counter to what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. Yeah. So you're kind of saying like, no, it's not going to, it's not going to really deliver real quality results if you're just trying to fake it. Yeah. Anyone disagree? Okay, right here in the Navy. I don't do it so much at work, but with my teenage daughter. <laughs> go on for hours about her hair color. And I'm just like, oh, yeah. <laughs> so I check that at the door when I go to work. But I think in some situations, you kind of have to fake it just to keep the peace a little bit. Okay, so you're saying you're kind of faking caring. Well, I'm going to kind of sit in this conversation, yeah, but I really don't. A really mundane, it's like, oh my God, are we beating this horse again? Gotcha. All right, thank you very much. So Ed Shine, um, he's a, a pretty great researcher as it pertains to like organizational development and humble inquiry is one of the terms that he's coined. But this is what he says. Humans are very sensitive creatures, and we send many signals of which we are not aware. The insincere boss is spotted very quickly. I suspect that if I am not interested, the other person will sense it no matter how I phrase my question. 
So I, we, I know we do our best efforts to you know, train managers and train leaders of like, these are the things that you do. And, and you know, I've done it back in the day when I did customer service and I needed to empathize with the person on the other end. And I said, I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry that happened. My, my bonus or commission depended on me saying I'm sorry when they expressed some emotion. So I said it and I did it. But basically what Dr. Shine is saying is that people will pick it up if it's not authentic, if it's not genuine. Second skill we're going to talk about is validation. Validation is acknowledging the kernel of truth in any situation, in any, in any interaction. So you're kind of saying that where the person is coming from makes sense. It doesn't mean that you like it. It doesn't mean you agree with it. it. You're just kind of acknowledging that I can see where you're coming from. I can see why you felt that way or why you had that response or how it impacted you that way. That's all validation is. Validation is super, super important for others, also super important for yourself because sometimes it could feel like, well, if I'm validating what they're saying, then I'm, I'm invalidating what I'm saying. That's not true. Two things can be right at the same time. Or they can also just be different perspectives of the same thing. So it's not a tug of war. It's not a black or white and or. It's both and. Either or. It's both and. OK. A great tip for validation is in terms of the way to start um, a sentence is it makes sense. It makes sense that you would feel that way based on this. So if you're going to try it, and maybe like you're just like, OK, Catherine says this works. I'm going to give it a go. It makes sense that, and then just go ahead and proceed. So I'm going to have you guys practice the, these skills uh, in a moment. Before I do, I just want to role play a little bit of like what, what it looks like, what it sounds like in real life. So I'm going to have Sonia come up. And on your handout, um, I've got a couple of scenarios for you that I'm going to have you work from. But I'm going to use one right now. I'm going to go with scenario number one with Sonia. And so basically the scenario is, in a group setting, your manager announces departmental changes. You believe these changes will increase your workload, and you do not feel happy about it. You decide to speak up and share your feelings and concerns quite emphatically during that meeting. So Sonia, this is happening to you. And I told Sonia that she can kind of channel her own emotions <laughs> if she were in this situation. And I'm going to model kind of what this humble inquiry and validation will look like in real life. Okay. and come in early, and come in on weekends. I don't know. This is not a good idea. OK. So. <laughs> <laughs> Say it one more time, a little louder to make sure everyone can hear, and then I want to get, get into character here. Show us the mic. Yeah. Which, oh, there's a mic. Yes, yes. Uh, all right. Can you hear me? OK. I don't think this new system is going to work. We tried it last year, and nobody got the training that they needed. I don't know. We already are staying late. We're working through our lunches. We're coming in early, and we have to come in during the weekends. This is not a good idea. So what I'm hearing you say, Sonia, it sounds like you're concerned that it's going to be a, um, a difficult process yeah. to do. I oh. know it is. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell me a little bit more about some of the challenges that you experienced when we tried it last time? We didn't get the training we needed. We were just handed the system and said, do your work. And then when we weren't learning correctly, people were yelling at us. So, mm. <laughs> So I can see how it can be very frustrating when you're being asked to do a task and you didn't receive the training that you needed. Yes. That makes sense. OK. So, so I'm not engaging in the conversation saying that, like, defending my position or saying this change is going to happen. I'm hearing her out. We can get there eventually and get her on board, but most times people just want to be heard. And, and validation is a magic tool. I, 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 I lie to you not. It's a magic tool in terms of when people feel validated, then they can better hear what you're saying and you can collaborate and work together better. Thank you. That was awesome. <laughs> OK, so now it's your turn to practice. Um, what I'm going to have you do is to break in teams of three. So on page four, you're going to see where I've got three columns. There's an employee, there's a leader, and there's an observer. Oh, I've got a question in the back. Yes. Oh, um, yeah, go ahead and share if you can. 
Yes, yeah, some people in the back, last roll need, needs them. Yeah, go up, please do share. Um, what I have, okay, so on page three, there are tips about things to remember for humble inquiry and validation. And then page four, one more. Thank you. All right, so we're gonna break into groups of three. We're gonna have an employee, we're gonna have a leader, and we're gonna have an observer. And you're all gonna have different roles. So we'll have the employee select the situation that they're gonna role play. So there's three I've given you here. If you're going through a, a, a situation and the leader's like, hey, I've got a real one here that I would love to try these skills on, that's okay too. So what that leader would do is just go ahead and tell the employee, like give them context of the situation, and then the employee will go ahead and just role play out that situation, and the leader will practice the skills. So the leaders are gonna choose whatever skills they're gonna practice. You can do one, you can do both, doesn't really matter, but don't tell the person which one you're trying. Just go ahead and give it a go. And then the job of the observer is to just notice and observe the interaction. And go for about five minutes, and then just discuss how it went, starting first with the observer, then the employee, then the leader, and then switch, switch the roles, okay? So I'd say maybe five to seven minutes each um, person, and then I'll bring you back to discuss how it went. And I'll um, give you, a, a, I'll ring the bell when it's time to switch, and then <laughs> ring the bell twice when it's time to bring everyone back. Any questions, anything that's not clear? Okay, so you're gonna break into groups of three, please, and go for it. I'm so excited that you guys are so excited about this. So I wanna talk about how it went, how it felt. Were there any skeptics that are now believers? If you're still a skeptic, you know, you can kinda of just process that on your own and, <laughs> just kidding. Um, <laughs> all right, how did it go? Okay, see so you here in the stripes. Right, exactly. So you're saying hard as a leader to not just solve the problem and try to troubleshoot right away. Yeah, but to like sit there and just sit in it and take it in and like hear them, but also not like take on their emotions. You got it. Yes, hear them, but not necessarily take on their emotions. And that happens sometimes too, especially when it comes to anxiety. Um, so when you're with really anxious people, sometimes you start feeling their anxiety. So kind of recognizing it and validating them as people and you can understand how they're feeling and why they're feeling that way and not let that, you know, invade your, your experience. Absolutely. So your hand here in the gray? Uh, I, I really enjoyed that. I felt like it was super fruitful and I got some good advice on an actual scenario that I'm dealing with at work. So it's amazing. Uh, I feel like the, the role play was hard and it really um, showed the challenge around doing this successfully um, and that when we when we weren't in that kind of like face-to-face -face scenario and we're kind of spitballing afterwards I feel like we were able to come to more productive um, discussion but I think those things really reinforce how if you can get to that kind of place with the person that you're talking to yeah you're gonna find solutions where it's like oh we're just what can we do here you know like I'm if, if you find yourself really open, if, yeah, if, every, if, if you can get discussion to where both participants are, are adding suggestions, then you can really start to make headway. Mm -hmm. And did you feel that you were, that was able to happen in, in that moment, like when you're, because one of the things that I wanted, I was hoping to do is bring the emotion of the experience into the scenario, because that's kind of what it might really play out yeah. like. And so you were saying in that moment, it was a little more difficult, but afterwards, you were able to kind of more? Yeah, it, was, it seemed a lot easier for everybody once they did not assume the actual role of the supervisor or the boss. Um, <laughs> so how to achieve that is unclear. So, <laughs> and I want to make sure I'm understanding you correctly. So you were saying as the boss, it was very difficult. Yeah, it seemed like role playing from the position of, yeah, of the person receiving this feedback. That, that's where the real challenge is, right? Is to be open to that feedback yeah. from the upset part of 
party. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and one of the things, I don't think I mentioned this when I was describing Humble Inquiry, is that um, you know, we have a, a, a tendency to have a lot of assumptions, and so we might make statements based on those assumptions. And we may or may not be correct. Most times we're not. But with humble inquiry, you can kind of just ask and find out what the other person is thinking or where they're coming from. So we really don't have to assume. We could just ask. But yeah, thank you so much. That's really, really valuable. Yeah, in the back. I love that question. So the question was kind of like she finds that she's able to validate more with people that she can tolerate. Um, people that you can't tolerate or maybe they're agitating you in some way, it's a little bit more difficult. That's true. That's real. So this is where the mindfulness comes into play because we're saying, okay, in this moment, this person's saying something to me and I'm noticing myself kind of having a reaction for whatever reason it is. Sometimes we're aware, aware why. Other times we're not. We're just kind of like, okay, I'm really not you know, feeling what's going on or something that is making me feel uncomfortable. So part of the process is to notice, to notice that, that you're kind of having this reaction and you're being mindful of that. So you're not going to judge, you're not going to judge your reaction. Um, just thinking about it from a place of growing on both ends. So you're, you're going to be helpful in that conversation, but then there's also an opportunity for personal growth after the fact. So part of it is, first of all, we're not going to rush through it and try to get it over with. That's what happens sometimes when we're feeling something that's uncomfortable or we don't, a, an emotion that's like maybe a negative emotion or we don't want to feel it anymore. We do whatever we can to get away from that experience. And that's what we're not going to do. We're going to sit with it and we're going to allow it to be there. And I would say kind of just work with that emotion. So um, let's see, if you're trying to, a good, a good place to start is just to validate and, and hear where the person's coming from. And even if you can't, like fully with your own emotions, feel their pain, it's okay to just kind of say, it sounds like it sounds like that was really difficult for you. And so you're acknowledging that I can't maybe fully empathize the way I would like to, but I can tell that you're in pain and that is difficult for you and it sounds like it's kind of rough. And then they're gonna just kind of say, yeah, it was, and then continue with the conversation. So it's gonna keep things moving and it's gonna preserve that relationship. And then you can you know, process it and work on it and, and recognize what it was that was difficult in that moment for you and then continue to work through that as you're developing and growing. Yeah, does that answer your question? Yes. Okay, perfect, yes. Um, so obviously when we're role playing, right, we have the role of the verbal cues, Okay, so to make sure I'm understanding, you're saying like if you're working globally and maybe it's via phone or video conference and you don't really have the full verbal cues that you do when you're having a face-to-face -face conversation. Or non-verbal cues, thank you. Okay, so that is a little um, more difficult. Um, great question, right? Because we're talking about this in the context of future of work and we're saying this is what we can expect. It's great if we have video, but sometimes it might just be a phone or a conference call and you're having to kind of ascertain or discern these things. Um, I'm grateful because I've, in my own job, I've had this experience where I've been having to follow people via phone, which I wasn't trained that way and it was super uncomfortable and I didn't want to do it, but like this is what is needed and so this is what I'm going to do. So I'm prepared to answer your question. <laughs> um, and so basically what it means is you are going to work a little bit harder because now that's verbal and um, visual information that you don't have. So you're going to be relying on your, your sense of hearing more and you're going to be listening for these things. And so... Part of you know, the skill is you're, 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 you're not guessing, but you're trying to get a sense of where the person's coming from, how they feel, what they're saying. And so you're going to get a sense. And then humble inquiry is going to be so essential because that's when you're going to just verbally you know, ask. 
and be open to correction too, because if you're asking a question and maybe there was some misinformation and they correct you, thank them for that and keep it moving. So it's just really relying on that sound and app. you're probably gonna ask more questions and sometimes I'll ask a question and say, did I, you know, is that correct, did I understand? And so if there's any uncertainty or even if, even if um, maybe you're not feeling uncertain but there's a tone or there's an emotion that's coming across from the other end where something didn't go right, it's okay to acknowledge that and, and just kind of say, you know, it, it sounds like something may have been miscommunicated and just ask that question, did, did I miscommunicate something? And so that's okay to just acknowledge whatever that emotion is in the room and just kind of ask a question around it with the intent of building a relationship. So that's the thing with humble inquiry is it's not about the what. It's about the how and the why. So yeah, so no is the answer to that question. Um, whatever question you ask is okay. It's just all about your motivation. And there's different types of questions. So sometimes we can ask leading questions or we can ask diagnostic questions where maybe we have a hypothesis and we're just kind of asking questions to see if it's gonna fit into that box, which has its place, but that's not humble inquiry. So we're gonna come in there completely open and curious and wanting to build that relationship. Yeah, thank you. Um, I saw a hand over here and this. Did I, okay, in the back? Oh, I see. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, and I saw a hand over here. Yes, in the black. I have a question about um, exiting uh, uncomfortable conversations. <laughs> so <laughs> if I'm the leader and I'm having a conversation and I'm finding that we're in the same pattern where I'm like, I hear you, and they're like, yeah, 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 that work sucks. And I'm like, I hear you. Yeah, yeah, that work sucks. So not that that happened to me because I don't manage a team, thank you. Um, but <laughs> how do you get out of that? Like, how, how do you... With humility and vulnerability, say, like, this is no longer a productive conversation. We just need to table that. Or is that it? That's, <laughs> yep, I'm glad. <laughs> nope, not it. <laughs> not it. That's a great question, right? And that's, and that's data. If they're still talking and you're saying, I hear you, for whatever reason, they're not feeling heard, right? So what that means is you're, now it's for you to change something you're doing. So instead of saying, I hear you, it could be, what I'm hearing you saying is this. Is this correct? Um, or did I misunderstand? This is what I'm understanding. Did I misunderstand something? That would be a humble inquiry, right? Because if they're still trying to communicate, they, they didn't feel like it landed. Yeah, and that's also part of the process. Again, if we're trying to get out of a conversation, we're not feeling comfortable about this. It's okay to you know just acknowledge that something's not going right here and open it up to let's kind of try to resolve whatever this is that's getting us out of stalemate. And even if it's like, you know, maybe I'm not in the best place to have this conversation and I really want to hear you, can we circle back again tomorrow? Yeah, because I mean, again, we we're talking about real life and sometimes we're just having a day where it's like, I'm not my best and the skills that I want to be using right now, I'm not really able to get there and I can tell it's impacting this interaction. But what you're saying is important and I want to hear you. Yeah, but great question. I saw someone over here, yes. Yeah, I appreciate what you're saying. Yeah, so you're saying that when you stopped trying to solve the problem, so the problem wasn't whatever the content was. The, the new problem is like, I just want to hear you. That's what I want to focus. I want to hear you. And when you heard them, it just naturally kind of followed through and came to a solution on its own. Yeah, that's the, the magic, if I can use that word, the magic of it, is it, it does happen. And I think sometimes because emotions can seem so nebulous and then we think if we follow that, it's never going to end. But that's 
it doesn't end when a person's not feeling hurt, but you're right. When they're feeling hurt, it has an end and it has a natural end and both parties can leave feeling like they've accomplished something. Yeah, that's a great comment. Thank you. And here, that's my five minute warning. <laughs> Yes, yes. Uh, it made me think of some people that aren't willing to come when there's these issues mm -hmm. with their boss or leader. Yes. How do you encourage and set up the space that you welcome that, um, just that to be able to get into that conversation? Yeah, that's a, I keep saying that's a great question. All the questions are great. That's a great question. And, and you're right, and so that's also part of the, the role is that you're modeling these things. They, because that's one of the ways that we learn is by looking at others, and so they're gonna learn that it's okay and that it's safe by watching you. So you can initiate it, and again, it's, it's a matter of if you notice something, you notice a change in a, a, the behavior or something like that, hey, I noticed this, you know, is it okay if we have a conversation about it? And then they have an opportunity to learn that you can trust people in authority and, and in leadership. If they never have that opportunity, then that's a learning that they, don't, they won't be able to have. So yeah, you're giving them that opportunity. All right, we're gonna wrap it up. I can, yeah, well, let's go ahead and wrap it up now. Um, so I wanna make sure that the takeaways, say what you are gonna say, say it and say what you said. This is what I said, this is what we did today. But what we're talking about, work is changing and, and that's pretty definitive. And I was giving you skills and tools, so I take them, Practice them, you get better the more you do it, kind of like walking. Well, I guess it kind of <laughs> flattens out after a while. But keep practicing them and keep learning. All right, thank you. Oh, and fill out the survey. <laughs> <laughs>